Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and there's a couple of debates that I've seen that feature Nathan Thompson. In fact, I have been in a debate myself with Nathan Thompson. However, there is one thing that I've noticed that each of these debates have in common. And that is, of course, that Nathan keeps on repeating the same tired, debunked points that he seems to have in a presentation. Maybe that's why he keeps on repeating them. So for this video, I'll be looking at the introduction that Nathan gave during his debate with Aaron Ra and responding to the points that he makes. And Nathan, I get the feeling that you're watching this video, so if you're going to have another debate, don't repeat the same things that have been debunked time and time again, because otherwise you look like an idiot. People always mistake me as a flat earth idiot, that's fine. Oh, don't worry. They're not mistaking you as anything. They've got it bang on. Because we learn from our mistakes, guys. Well, if that's the case, Nathan, I hope that you'll be able to learn from your mistakes of using the same bad arguments time and time again. You didn't have any debates, but you did have a discussion with Jaron from Jaronism where you asserted a bottom-up fallacy. Apparently, you don't know things disappear bottom-up on a flat surface, too. You think things disappearing bottom first is empirical proof of earth curve. I thought that was funny. So the first thing that I want to mention here is that there is no such thing as a bottom-up fallacy. It's just something that Nathan invented to try and sound smart and to dismiss his opponent's points. Secondly, flat earthers don't provide good reasons why objects should disappear bottom first as they get further away from you on a flat earth, which if the earth were flat, they should be able to do this with ease. You straw man a model approximately a dozen times, which is a hat trick fallacy. So straw man, then you're begging the question, and you're also doing a reification fallacy because it's not empirical evidence, it's not science, it's a model. So Nathan clearly doesn't understand the point of a model here. The point of a model is not to say, this is true, now believe it. The point of a model is to make accurate predictions of what you'd expect to see happen. And if those predictions are accurate, then the model is most likely correct. And not having a model is not a huge win as flat earthers would like you to believe because a core part of science is falsifiability. So if you don't have a model, then you can't falsify it, which means that it is by definition not science. Would the sun be out all day on a flat earth? Now, apparently you don't understand. Sometimes the sun is out all day in the north. Now, it disappears due to perspective, angular resolution limits, atmospheric magnification, disappears bottom first because that's how things disappear on a flat surface. So I'm going to go through each of these one by one. But first, why are there so many explanations for the sun disappearing at night on a flat earth? Having a lot of explanations isn't always the gotcha that you think it might be. The reason being is that generally when it comes to an explanation for something, usually there's one major factor and there might be a couple of other smaller factors that may affect your results. Now just because you're given a bunch of explanations, that doesn't mean that your argument is immediately discredited. But seeing as you haven't described how each of these explanations affects the results that we're seeing, it does make me wonder. So let's start with perspective. And perspective just means as something gets further into the distance, it's going to get smaller. Now the next was angular resolution limits, which is a very interesting one because that has to do with diffraction. And Nathan, what is diffraction? Wait, this is the wrong Nathan. But to be fair, diffraction isn't really all that important here. What it seems like Nathan's trying to get at is more how small can something be before it disappears from view? The answer is, of course, 0.017 degrees, which becomes a problem for Nathan. The reason being is, let's say that the furthest away that the sun can get from you on a flat earth is 25,000 kilometers. And let's say that the sun is about 32 kilometers in diameter. The smallest that the sun would ever be at that size and at that distance is about 0.7 degrees. I like to put it at about a thousand kilometers high because that gives them a fair bit of leeway. But even if the sun is at a height of a thousand kilometers and is 25,000 kilometers away, 
it should still be 2.3 degrees above the horizon. Now that is a fair amount above the horizon, but his next point is atmospheric magnification. Now the problem with atmospheric magnification is I hear this all the time from flat earthers. However, there's just no evidence for it. Now to be fair, it does sound a lot like atmospheric refraction, which there is evidence for. However, flat earthers never say how atmospheric magnification would actually work. And if they did say how it worked, would actually be able to test to see if it actually exists. And his last point was that things disappear bottom first on a flat surface and you've just got no evidence for that. But if you increase in altitude, the sun and the moon, which I've done this observation myself on my channel, they disappear into small dots above the horizon. So the first point is Nathan, how are you controlling for glare? Because I've seen the observation of the moon that you've done and you did not control for glare at all. One of the ways that you could control for glare if you wanted to would be to lower the exposure on your camera. This has worked for me when I've taken observations of the moon myself. Secondly, you just said that the sun would disappear bottom first on a flat surface. So which is it? Does it disappear bottom first or does it disappear above the horizon? I've also done a test myself. Stars do not intersect the marine horizon. Now, I don't actually know what he's saying because when I search for what he's saying or anything related to what he's saying, it just comes up with a whole lot of unrelated stuff. It sounds like what he's saying is that stars don't set below the horizon and if that is true, Nathan, just point me to where I should look in the sky, I'm in the southern hemisphere by the way, to where I can find Polaris. So another test I've done is the green flash. Uh, I've observed the sun setting where the top of the sun turns green for a moment. Now, if the sun was going below the horizon, the red, orange, yellow color spectrum inverts, similar to the prism on the front of the Pink Floyd album, the red, the orange, the yellow are above the green, the purple, and the blue. But when the light is coming from above a prism, the green is above the red, orange, yellow spectrum. So Nathan is misunderstanding green flashes here. The reason why green flashes occur is because light is actually being bent downwards. So because red light is refracted less, we actually see it coming from a position closer to where the sun actually is. And because green light is refracted more, it ends up being higher than where the sun is. And we should all know by now that light being bent downwards makes things appear higher than they actually are. So that actually means that green flashes are evidence for a globe. Whoopsie. Couldn't find anything of the sort on Orange Channel, I don't even know why he's here debating this. I don't think he's qualified. So I just wanted to respond to this part because Nathan, you're not qualified to talk about the shape of the earth. Just so you guys know, science has been hijacked. Ever since we were little kids, they taught us science is an empirical method. When we do science, we prove things. Well, no, I don't know where you were taught, but when I went to school, we weren't taught that science proves things. We're taught that science disproves things. All of the scientists that I've ever talked to will tell you that science is used to disprove things, never to prove things. Now, if science is unable to disprove something, then it is usually regarded as true, but only if it is falsifiable. First thing I wanna talk about is how far can we see, ladies and gentlemen? If the Earth is a globe 24,901 miles around, as the heliocentric model would assert, there would be downward curve tangent to your feet in all directions. And there is. Now, for example, this is a famous photo Joshua Nowicki took from the other side of Chicago. I've been to the lake. I've done this observation, not from Joshua Nowicki, but from New Buffalo, which is approximately 10 miles shorter. But he actually got a clearer picture than I could on that day. And they said that because it was so clear on this day on the news that this was a mirage. Now they want you to believe when it's clear and you can see really far, that's distortion, that's miraging. But when things can't be seen, that's earth curve. Now that is the opposite of any logical thinking. So it's actually rather simple. There's a big difference between not being able to see something because something is in the way versus not being able to see something because it's way too blurry. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put my hands in front of my face. You will not be able to see my face until I take my hands away. But when I take my hands away, I'm gonna blur the video ever so slightly 
but you can still see my face, even if it's kind of blurry. Now my point there is, just because something is blurry or distorted, that doesn't mean that it can't be hidden by something else when it's perfectly clear. Also, mirages that allow us to see more do happen, so stay mad. Period, but next you have all these lighthouses, ladies and gentlemen, should be obscured by 329 feet over here in France, um, visibility 28 miles away, okay? Should be obscured, there's multiple. I can show you San Jacinto right here. Now, Glovers would say, oh look, you can't see it in this picture, but the problem is once you flip on the infrared, you can see much farther. So admittedly, I did have a hard time with this one, but that's because I assumed that the numbers given here were correct, and they're not. In fact, what he shows there is exactly what we'd expect to see on a globe. So the first question that we should ask ourselves is, what exactly do we expect to see on the globe? Because the person who made that image would have you believe that we shouldn't see any of the mountain on a globe. In reality, this is what we expect to see on a globe. A big shout out, by the way, to AB Science for helping me with this. Now, when we overlay one of the images on top of the other, this is what we actually get. As you can see, what we'd expect to see on a globe matches with the observations taken. So why would Nathan think that this is proof of a flat Earth? The reason is, of course, a fudging of the numbers. Because at 20 miles away, the land obstructions are purported to be 250 feet tall. And the person that made the image calculated that they should obstruct 1.5 thousand feet of the mountain. Now I know how they came up with this number and they would be correct if they were an ant taking the picture at sea level, but they're not and they've listed the observational height as 150 feet. Now when you actually account for the observer height, like you should be doing, the amount of the mountain that the land obstruction should hide is only 615 feet. And that's not even accounting for the amount that the land obstruction should be hidden by due to earth curve. So when it comes to the observation that Nathan just showed, if you do the maths correctly, it shows a globe. Good job, Nathan. The second argument the earth isn't a globe is called specular reflections. So a specular reflection means a uh, reflection of light where the angle of reflected light equals the angle of incident light but on the opposite side of the surface normal. It occurs on mirrors, for example, and also mirrors and glass are perfectly flat. It's a property of fluid statics. When large bodies of water are at rest, they lay level and horizontal to the container. So, so firstly, specular reflections can occur on any reflective surface, whether it be flat or whether it be curved. Now, when it comes to his claim about mirrors being flat, yes, this mirror is flat, but this mirror isn't flat. And even if all mirrors were flat, that doesn't mean that the Earth is flat. Now, as for Nathan's last claim about bodies of water being level, why are they? The answer is, of course, that liquids will conform to forces acting upon them. So if there are forces forcing water into the shape of a ball, that is the shape that the liquids will take. First argument, Earth's not a globe. Second argument, do we spin 1,039 miles an hour? I thought the second argument was about specular reflections. Maybe Nathan forgot how to count to three. That's what heliocentric model asserts at the equator. We spin, it's the cause of day and night, and we're moving approximately 1,039, 1,040 miles an hour. So Nathan, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to use the actual units. The actual units is 15 degrees per hour is how fast the Earth spins. Problem with this, how would a spinning Earth affect our atmosphere? It's two options, guys. It would either move as one cohesive synchronized body, which is what I've heard Aaron say in his discussion with Jaron. But he says the atmosphere moves with the Earth which is denying mainstream science. So what people usually mean when they say that the atmosphere rotates with the Earth is they mean that, for the most part, the atmosphere rotates 15 degrees per hour like the Earth does. Now obviously, as you get further away from the Earth's surface, the atmosphere will rotate slower, but you need to be over 40 kilometers away 
to get a 0.1 degree per hour difference in rotation. Denying what we were taught as kids, which is that the earth moves under sniper bullets, the earth moves under a Sagnac interferometer, Bob proved it on Netflix. Hey guys, I think that Nathan might be coming around to the globe model because he just said that Bob proved that the earth spins. The atmosphere, this is what mainstream science doesn't even say happens, but I just want to cover it because it was Aaron's position earlier. If the atmosphere moves with the earth, that would necessitate that the atmosphere goes faster and faster the more you increase in altitude. Now, great, there is no force that would cause things to increase in velocity as they increase in altitude. Now, I do agree with Nathan here, but the problem is, is that in his graphic, he has the atmosphere traveling at 1,400 miles an hour to keep up with the Earth. For the atmosphere to have to go that fast to keep up with the Earth, it would have to be over 2,200 kilometers high. Now, I don't know what examples Nathan likes to give, but I'm sure that none of his examples would be that high. Because he's asserting that as a hot air balloon or a helicopter or a drone, an insect, smoke from a volcano, as it goes up in the air, it's traveling faster and faster to maintain its tangential vector above the Earth. Now, that is crazy. Now the problem with all the examples that Nathan cited there is that none of them go above 20 kilometers high and at the height of 20 kilometers you'd only have to make up for about 3 miles per hour. Now I'm not an expert in meteorology but if you were going to test this I'm sure that wind would be able to go far faster than 3 miles an hour. So you've got 5 miles per hour at the park is fun, 60 miles per hour intense, you could lose your lunch. Aaron will assert 1,040 miles per hour on a spinning ball it's just a walk in the park, you feel nothing. And I'm sure that whenever anyone goes on a plane, they're just holding on for dear life because planes can go up to 500 mile an hour sometimes. Finishing up my last argument, could the atmosphere even exist without a physical container, guys? So you have an infinite vacuum of space next to our pressurized atmosphere. This is a violation of entropy, it's violation of second law of thermodynamics. So anyone that says this clearly doesn't understand the second law of thermodynamics because the second law of thermodynamics is actually about the amount of usable energy in a system. So as long as the amount of usable energy in an isolated system is decreasing, then it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics. And at the end of the day, all that a container really is is just a force. So as long as you've got a force keeping the atmosphere in place, then you're gonna be fine. And also, there is a pressure gradient which doesn't seem to disperse for any reason, which is definitely a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And yes, I am talking about the second law of thermodynamics, not the second law of thermodynamics. But anyway, that is Nathan's opening for debates. He keeps on using the same one, and it's gotten boring. He needs to get new material. Which should be easy if the earth was actually flat. Right, Nathan? But with that, leave a like and subscribe if you liked that video. And make sure you turn on bell notifications so that you actually get notified of when I post new videos. But as always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. What Jesus, Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Jane Spade, Wolfie, Mori, The Friendly Antinatalist, Graymore Ghost, and Kid Vicious. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link right there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching. I suppose I should also thank Nathan because I am definitely going to be using this as proof of the globe in the future.